So good to see you. How are you? Good, great. All right. Well, that's two of us. I'm doing great. So thanks for asking. Um, so I see that you're here, but also I want to figure out who's here. So I need you guys to participate in something. And uh, if you don't participate, I'm going to have to call you out publicly. So no pressure. Okay, none at all. Of course, I'm not going to call you out publicly, but I will ask you to do this. I want you to look at the person next to you, and I want you to tell them what your favorite food is to eat when you go to the movie theater. The movie theater. There are are no healthy options, so don't try and fake it, okay? Go for it. All right, you got it? How many people said popcorn? Please raise your hand. See, these are the salty people. That's who they are right there, just so you know. That's the salty people. For me, whenever I was, whenever I was young, I used to love going to the movie theater because that was one of the rare times I got to have milk duds. Like, I never got to have it any other time except I would go there and... And, and as a kid, I would just look forward to I can't wait to get to the Milk Duds. It was going to be so good. And I used to just love eating Milk Duds. I would look forward to it. It seemed like it was the only place I'd ever get to have it. It was the only time my parents would ever allow me to. And I didn't get to go to the movies very often at all. But when we did, it was the rare treat that I got to have Milk Duds. Here's the thing. Everything that you mentioned, and some of you said popcorn, some of you said I don't know what else you said, but you know what you said. The person next to you knows what you said. But here's the thing. When it comes to the movie theater, there are no healthy options. So whatever you said, I want you to think about that for just a moment. Like you have it? What you said, do you have it? Is it in your mind? By the way, if, if that involves you sneaking food into the movie theater, I don't believe that's ethically right. So just erase that and replace it with something that you could actually buy there. Okay? So let's just, good, we're good now. Um, maybe forgiveness of your sins. I don't know what, I don't don't know, confession. I don't know what needs to happen. Anyway, you have that thing that's in your mind. Like if you lived your life where that's all you ate, what kind of life would you have? Unhealthy. Unhealthy. That was a young one in the audience who just said unhealthy. Like it would be unhealthy. Like if if I just had a steady diet of milk duds. Now for a while, it would be awesome. I'm not going to lie. It'd be good. I mean, there'd be some like teeth issues, of course, over the, you know, for after a while, but it would be really good and I would enjoy it. And I'd be like, "Mm, it's chocolatey. It's chewy. It's like everything I want life to be like. It's that it's just so good. I would enjoy it. But after a while, what kind of nourishment would this provide for my body? None. Right. Same thing with what you said, because what's not on your list is carrots, celery, Uh, It's a negative calorie food. You need more of that in your life. Like you didn't say those things. So the options that we have are largely unhealthy options, right? So the thing that you said, if you had a steady diet of it, you you would be able to survive most likely, but you wouldn't have much of a life. Today, we're going to talk about how we should live our life to have spiritual nourishment. See, here's the thing I know for sure. If you were to live your life, to where you just have a salvation story, but you don't do anything after that, you'll be saved, but you're not going to have much of a spiritual life. It's like, I could live my life off of milk duds probably for a very long time. It's an unhealthy option, option for sure, but I could survive if I eat these milk duds. By the way, these are gone. <laughs> just in case you're wondering, put it up to the microphone, they're gone, Right? So I could live my life off of these, but I wouldn't have much of a life. I could get along for a little while, but after a while, it would have a negative effect on my life, just like the thing that you just mentioned. If you're a follower of Jesus, I just want you to know a full expectation of this church. Within this church, if you're a follower of Jesus, we expect you to behave like a follower of Jesus. If you're not a follower of Jesus, we expect you to act like a lost person. We don't expect lost people to act like saved people, but get this, we expect saved people to act like saved people. Amen? I noticed it was a real quiet amen on that one. You're like, is he talking about me? I don't know, maybe. But all of us, if you, all of us who are Christians, we are to be becoming more like Jesus, which means that we need to be with Jesus, do what Jesus did so that our lives can become more like Jesus. Becoming is this. Becoming, rest in belief, upon Jesus for salvation. But if I'm honest, this is where a lot of us stop. 
A lot of us stop right here and we say, no, I got my fire insurance. I ain't going to hell no more. That's what happened. I walked the aisle and I was up there. It was a fire and brimstone and I walked up. I, and then I, walk, I walked up there a filthy sinner, but I walked away redeemed. And you haven't grown a bit since then. If I'm honest, I question your salvation. I do. I question your salvation. Only God fully knows you. But there should be evidence in your life. And yet maybe... Maybe some of us even, we got this amazing salvation through Jesus. And you're saved. And maybe you just stopped growing because that's all you thought that you had to do. And that happens too. To where you just, you got saved and you're like, that's awesome. Now I just get to attend church and I get to serve and I'll be in a community group and I'm done. I'm done. That's not much of a life either. Here's what I know is there's going to be a time in your life where, where you're going to be overwhelmed. It's going to be a season of suffering. Happens to everybody. Maybe a, a season of, of not just suffering, but maybe it's a season of loneliness. And yet, you're going to need something more than just salvation. You're going to need the rest of it. You need the abiding in Him. That's, that's now becoming a rest upon belief for, for salvation, but a rest upon Jesus for salvation. It also, it abides in Him for connection and direction while imitating His example. So again, we expect Christians to act like what the Bible says a Christian should be like. We expect people who are far from God to act like people who are far from God, and we don't mix the two. Because we understand. We understand. Now, I want to let you have this right out of the gate, the, the takeaway for today. You don't have to wait until the end of the talk, so you can just go right back to sleep as soon as I give you this, right? So here's the takeaway. Some of you are like, I ain't going to sleep. That's good. Um, the person next to you is going to wake you up anyway, so just may as well listen. Takeaway is this. To become more like Jesus We must do the private practices and the public practices because they reorient our hearts to God. To become more like Jesus, it doesn't happen by accident. It doesn't just happen by time and service. Like I got saved for, I've been saved for 20 years. I'm just automatically like Jesus. No, you're a whole lot like the old you, just saved. So we have to have some private practices. We're gonna talk about a few of those today. And you have to have some public practices because these things go together to form you or to reform and to reorient your heart toward God. Because what I know for sure from my own life, and I can't even say this for sure about yours, is I know that the life has just a way of knocking my feet out from under me. I know that the life has just a way and circumstances in my life. And and I believe that God brings those circumstances. I, I praise God that it's not chaos, there's order. That, that God does have a, a created order to things, but even in those moments where I tend to get overwhelmed, they reveal to me something about myself and also a greater need for God. We have to have our minds and our hearts to, re, to be reoriented towards God because life will try and take our legs out from under us continually. Many years ago, I was thinking recently how long ago, and I believe it was in, in high school, that I actually started to go to the gym. And at this, I was in strength training. And uh, that's when they go through and they tell you how to use all the machines. And then if you're a young boy, you, you lift more than what you possibly should, uh, just because that's what young boys do. And they just can be careless like that. So I would be in strength training and I learned how to use some machines and, and go through that. And that's really where I started to get into physical fitness. Now, you can tell by the looks of me that like I do it, but I'm not like over the top with it. And uh, so I've done it for a lot of years. And what I know about this is when I've, I've actually committed to my physical fitness that allows my, the rest of my life to be better too. When I, when I dig into my physical fitness, then when it comes to me having to push mow my lawn when my riding lawn mower doesn't work, I don't get winded. Like I know that, that when I, I get into my physical fitness, I know that even my stress level team seems to go down. Even when I dig into my physical fitness, it affects every other part of my life. Spiritually speaking, the same thing happens. When we dig into some spiritual practices, it isn't just an isolated thing. It affects other parts of your life too. It affects other parts of your life. 
You see, our spiritual exercises have a direct result into our everyday lives. Our spiritual exercises have a direct result into our everyday lives. Which means when we operate without rest, we get angry easier, don't we? When we go without praying, our minds get cloudy. Like there's a barrier between us and God and we just don't pray and then we just start to question, well, God, what do you want me to do? I don't know, what, what, what is it that you want me to do? What am I supposed to do? When we get self-reliant, this happens in my life from, from something I struggle with. When we get self-reliant, it seems that God superimposes something on us that gets outside of our control to show us where we need to be spiritually. When we get self-reliant, and self-reliance needs to have our needs to be reoriented back to God, to where it's God reliance. When we fail to be good stewards, or maybe when we become greedy or we hoard things, then automatically we have anxiety with and fear of losing those things. When we've had seasons of busyness and noise, we just can't seem to turn the switch off, can we? It's like once you've had seasons of busyness and noise and it's like you just can't switch it off. It's like you just keep going and going and going and going and going and you don't even know why you're going, but you've just had this season and you need a kill switch. I have, with pride I can tell you, I have been ejected off of two treadmills in my life. And one of them, I tripped on the treadmill and it ejected me off the back of the treadmill and I put a hole in the drywall. But in full transparency, it was at a hotel and I didn't tell anyone <laughs> for fear that I would have to fix it or somehow I'd be accountable. So I left them a surprise the next morning when they went to clean it probably. But isn't that true of life? Like sometimes when we outpace ourselves spiritually, life just ejects us. When it comes to becoming more like Jesus, I wanna help you so you don't outpace yourself, so that we spiritually can, we can make the long haul. But there's even more to it than that. So how can we avoid the pitfalls of bad character and make our world a better place? I mean, I know this is in your heart. You, you don't want to be a person of bad character. And I believe if you're here, you want the world to be a better place. How is this even possible? It's only possible when we commit to becoming more like Jesus. The scripture that we're going to be in this morning is in Hebrews 5. We're going to start in verse 11, going through chapter 6, verse 3. And then I've got some other supporting passages we're going to uh, just jump, uh, jump to along the way. But before we get to this, I just want to tell you something about what we're going to read. I'm going to jump right into a story. But Hebrews is an amazing read. So if you're like stuck in your Bible reading, Hebrews would be an, an amazing read because right at the beginning of Hebrews, it shows how Jesus is greater than the angels. He's greater than Moses. He's greater than this, this person in the Old Testament. That's kind of like this. He's a mysterious person um, who's the, the great high priest that Jesus is even greater than him. And that how Jesus is greater than the Old Testament system that Jesus ultimately wants to be our... He, he, he is our Sabbath rest if you're in Christ. Like he is, he is to be our Sabbath rest. Like all sorts of great things. So if you seem like you're even outpacing life, you need to jump back earlier um, into Hebrews 3 and 4 to see what it is uh, about Sabbath that, that, that the author of Hebrews says about Sabbath. It's incredible. But if you're stuck in your Bible reading, this would be a great place to be. We're gonna jump right into this story. It's right after the author of Hebrews. Um, we don't know for sure who it is. But the author of Hebrews goes in and he's just explained how Jesus is greater than the great high priest, the, the great high priest of the Old Testament, the one who's this mysterious character that I have a hard time saying his name, so I'm intentionally not saying it right now. You can see for yourself. But here's where we're going to be in verse 11. This is what the author of Hebrews says to the Hebrew Christians, but then also to us. We have much to say about this. But it's hard to explain because you're slow to learn. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, 
You need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use, that'd be a really good thing to underline or highlight if you do that in your Bible, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Here's a connecting word, therefore. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God, instruction about baptisms and the laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And God permitting, the author of Hebrews says, we will do so. He's, He's scolding the Hebrew Christians. He says, man, you need to be like so much farther in your walk. And it's just, you're just, you just need milk. You're just slurping the milk and thinking that's all there is. He says, but yet you ought to be teachers. There's a, there's a people that you need to be influencing for the gospel. There's a community you need to be shaping, but you just keep going back to the milk carton and slurping on the milk. And he says, but you should be so much farther in your walk with God. And he says, instead, we just have to keep reiterating the same old things. And I wonder, I wonder how many of you, like you've been, you've been drinking the milk, you haven't moved on to the solid food. Maybe you, move, you haven't moved and you've just been slurping the milk thinking that's what you're supposed to do. I get that. Thinking, well, I'm saved. I'm just letting you know that there will for sure be a season in your life where you will need the spiritual nourishment of the solid food and you need to get beyond the milk. Because there's going to be a pain point in your future There's going to be a suffering in your future. There's going to be a season of loneliness in your future. There's going to be the dark night of the soul in your future. And you are going to need the solid food that you should be consuming now to get you through that season later. I'm I'm not trying to scare you. This is just reality. This is the Christian life. It's not all bubblegum and roses. It's not. It's not all, woo, balloons, we're having a party today. Sometimes those balloons aren't colorful. Sometimes those balloons are black. Sometimes the cloud over the Christian life seems black. And we need now in a season, if you're not in that season, we need to dig into the word of God. We need to be becoming more like Jesus, abiding in Jesus for connection and direction for our lives, imitating the example that Jesus set for us because there will be a dark night of the soul. There will be a, God, where are you? There will be a severe loss. There will be a season in your life where you are physically limited. And you're going to need the solid food now to help sustain you then. This again, I'm not trying to scare you. I'm I'm trying to make you alert and aware because it's coming. Which is why I believe the author of Hebrews he, he scolds him. He says, you need milk, not solid food. Did you see the exclamation point in the scripture? He's like, you're just, shh, shh, you're just slurping the milk. But there's so much more for you to do. There's so much more for you to be. This is what I said in verse 12. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. There's the exclamation point. I think the two biggest problems in American Christianity today are these. The two biggest. There's probably a long list, but I think there's the two biggest problems are these. The first one is this, undiscipled disciples. Undiscipled disciples. And it's this, it's the belief that the test of the person's Christian faith is a matter of what a person knows intellectually while ignoring immaturity behaviorally. And I want you to know as your pastor, and I realize this, we maybe not even have met and maybe you're you're not even part of the family here. I, I long for you to be part of the family. You're welcome here. 
But I do want you to know up front, we, we no longer are going to tolerate Christians acting like lost people. We're not. We're no longer going to tolerate Christians who, who haven't grown in their walk with God. We, we just can't. There's too much, there's too much to do. You're, you're to be someone greater than, than what that is. You're, you have people that you're supposed to influence. You have a purpose you're supposed to live out. You have a, a divine destiny that God has for you. And we're not going to tolerate that anymore. We're not. If you're a Christian, we expect you to behave like a Christian. We expect you to have a life that is not perfect, not perfect, but a life that is, it looks like what the New Testament said the Christian life should look like. That's what, what we have to do. We can't tolerate, and we're not just going to ignore spiritual immaturity anymore. If you have been a Christian for 20 years, that should look different than if somebody has been a Christian for six months. And there's grace all in the span that I just set up. And there's going to be grace when you fail. But we're not just going to allow everybody to just ping back and forth and be immature anymore. There's way too much that God wants us to do. And there's way too much he wants us to be. So undiscipled disciples. The second one is this. Non-intentional discipleship. The second biggest problem. And I'll sum it up with this. The enemy's strategy, strategy is to keep God's people busy without replacing bad habits with the habits that will produce Christ-like character. So this is what it looks like in real life. Somebody gets saved and, and, and they go from, from death to life. And it's amazing. And, and they have a transformation and now they're saved and, and they came forward and their salvation's real. What's happened for a lot of Christians in a lot of churches and perhaps even in this church is that we've just, we've just said, okay, you just need to come to church. You need to be in a community group. You need to be in a Bible study and you need to serve and you're gonna become everything that Jesus wants you to be and you're gonna become like Jesus. You're gonna be holy. That's just not true. You have to have private and personal disciplines to replace your bad habits so that you can produce Christ-likeness. So that Christ-likeness can be produced in you by your connection, by your abiding, and by the direction that Jesus gives you. So I think these are the two biggest problems. Again, just my opinion. But the expectation for every follower of Jesus is this. It's growth. Constant, increasing, and persistent growth. That's the expectation. Not perfection. But the expectation for us, if you consider yourself a follower of Jesus, this is where we're going. We have way too much, we have way too much to do in our community. God is, is calling us to a much bigger thing than what we're currently involved in. And every, I want everybody to be bought into this, that we're not going to just settle for, for just slurping the milk anymore. Now we're going to dig into solid food for the glory of God and the good of the world. But the expectation for every follower of Jesus is, is clearly this. It's growth. Con it's just constant, it's consistent, it's increasing, and it's persistent growth. You will never hit perfection. That's not the goal. Growth is the goal. I love what Bill Hull said in his book called Choose the Life. It's a book I would highly recommend. He said this, believe what Jesus believed, and that helps develop your mind, Christ-like mind. Live as Jesus lived. Shaping Christ-like character. Love as Jesus loved, that affects your relationships. Minister as Jesus ministered, that's your service. Lead as Jesus led, that's influence. I love how he says this because this then becomes categorically where we should see growth. That all of us, we should see growth in these areas. I want you to think to yourself, where am I in these areas? Where do I need to grow? Hebrews 5.13 said this, Anyone who lives on milk, still, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. And the word not acquainted, I believe, is better translated not experienced. Not experienced. Because the elements of spiritual formation are things that we are to be experiencing. 
It's a matter of having our, our minds and our hearts reoriented to God. But this isn't a one-time thing. This is a continual thing. And the teaching of righteousness, they're not experienced. They're not acquainted with the teaching of righteousness. Paul said this in Romans 14, verse 17 through 19. He says, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but of living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. If we serve Christ with this attitude, you will please God and others will approve of you too. So then let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build one another up. Our experience about being acquainted, our experience and living a life of righteousness, it looks like what Paul says here. And I'll say this, it's helpful. When you live a life that's connected to Jesus, it's also helpful. Um, who's, who's ever seen those pictures of bodybuilders? I mean, like, I mean, these people are just like jacked. They have body parts that I'm sure I don't even have body parts, and they're huge. Anybody seen those people? And they, they get all oiled up, which I think is a little, okay, it's a lot gross. Um, and they get all tanned up, and you can't tell if, like, it's real or if it's like a costume. Who knows what I'm talking about? Like these bodybuilders and, like, all these things. And it, I, I, I look at these bodybuilders, and I'm thinking, and I see this on social media from time to time. It's like they're looking in front of the mirror. I'm like, literally, who spends that much time in front of the mirror? Who even has that much time to spend in the gym? Shall I digress? I just don't get it. But one thing I also don't understand is this. When I look at their life, and they put all their time into the gym, and they just get just Jack, they're huge. And they, and they do all that just so other people can judge their physique and just so they can, so they literally, um, they, that they will appear to be more put together than someone else. But then I sit back and think about this. I'm like, what do, by doing all of that, what is it that their bodies produce that my body can't? Not much. I think a lot of times what happens in the Christian life is this. We have the bodybuilder approach to where we think we need to be spiritually, like we need to be spiritually together. We need to be so spiritually together that other people look at us. That ultimately it isn't even a matter of, of becoming like Jesus. It's just becoming like a worse version of ourselves. To where we just grow spiritually just so other people will notice. I think when it comes to our spiritual walk with Jesus, a lot of times people just, it isn't even a matter of pursuing Jesus. It's just a matter of pursuing our ego. And yet we cover it with, oh, I'm a Christian. And really what it is, you just want people to notice how good you are. I love what Henry Nouwen said. He said, spiritual greatness has nothing to do with being greater than others. It has everything to do with being as great as each of us can be. As each of us can be. So what is the milk in our cultural context? Here's some ideas. The milk in our cultural context is this. It's attending but not participating. So it could be attending this, but yet you're not participating. You're not engaging with what's being said. You're not engaging with the worship. You're just kind of going through the motions. You're attending. You're checking the box off your list. You have to you make sure you do a check-in, you know, so your mom, your mom and them can see that you've been at church today. She's so like, oh, I've checked into Dublin Bible Church. It's like all of that. And it's like you're attending but not participating. That's milk in our cultural context. Salvation without discipleship, that's milk in our cultural context. It's saying, no, I got my fire insurance. I ain't going to hell no more. I just I walked the aisle and, and I, I just made sure that I was right with Jesus. That is actually laughable. Jesus makes you right to be with Jesus. But salvation without discipleship, meaning that oh, I got saved, I don't need to do anything else. I'm good now. Third thing on my list is lack of community to think I can just attend and I can fly under the radar. I can get here a little bit late. I can leave when I see the, I see the preacher about to land the plane. He's about to land it. He's about to land oh, oh, we just We just dropped. We went from 10,000 to 5,000 to 2,000. Okay, I'm going to duck out now so nobody sees me. Lack of community. That's milk. You, you need me and I need you. And we need each other to become more like Jesus. There are private practices and public practices. Fourth one, consuming messages for someone else. Nobody's guilty of this, right? Nobody sat in a service and said, I oh, wish my brother-in-law was here. Or nobody sat in a service and said, I hope she's listening. And then you look down 
to see if she's taking notes, to see if she is listening. Consuming messages for somebody else, that's milk in our cultural context because I believe that God has a message for you. Not to just sift through you to go to somebody else. The last one is devotional reading without true Bible intake. And this one I totally understand. I, I absolutely get this one because what has been said of a lot of Christians is this. Once they get saved and he said, well, honey, you need to go get yourself a devotional. And you, once you read that devotional, they're going to give you a big, long story. And it's going to sound just like your life. So you just get this big, long devotional. And it's going to give you some little itty bitty scripture. And then it's going to give you three questions that apply that story and that scripture. And you're just going to be good with Jesus for the rest of the day. Right? I mean, that, that literally is what people are told. Is it not? I see you shaking your head. You know that's what people are told. That's not enough. That, that will not be enough for when you face the dark night of the soul. That little bit of milk is not going to be sustaining when the hard times come. It's not going to be sustaining. You need the solid food. You need to, to leave the elementary truths is what the author of Hebrews says. And move on to something greater. Devotion reading is a great place to start short term. But this too never replaces true Bible intake. Just reading the Word of God and allowing the Word of God and the Spirit of God to penetrate your heart through regular reading. I get it. If some of you, and all you do is your devotional and you scan through it, choo, 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 30 seconds with Jesus, I'm good for the rest of the day. You and I both know that's not enough. It's not sustaining. I'm not, I'm not angry with you. I want better for you. You have to leave that mindset, leave the milk, and get into the solid food. Speaking of solid food, this is what it says in verse 14. But solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Constant use, meaning repetition, or what we call practice. Paul wrote this in Romans 6, 12 and 13. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not live, or excuse me, do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become a, an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God, for you were dead, but now you've been, you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Your whole body. These are the private and the public practices of the elements of spiritual formation so that you can become more like Jesus as you spend time with Jesus and you do what Jesus did as you're imitating his example as you're abiding him for connection and you're abiding him for direction so you're resting in your salvation and the grace that came with it but now you can live the rest of your life stop slurping the milk and move on to solid food yet it, I sense the tension Right now, and you're like, okay, so what does that mean for me? Perhaps you're a little overwhelmed, and I'm about to put a list on the screen in a minute, on the screen in a minute, and you're going to be more overwhelmed, but I'm going to give you some hope right after that. I love what John Ortberg said about spiritual formation. He said this, spiritual formation is the process by which the inner self and the character are shaped. Spiritual formation, the spiritual practices, that's my word. It's the process by which your inner self and your character are shaped. These things aren't going to be shaped if you're just slurping the milk. These things are going to be shaped more and better when you leave the milk and get into the solid food. It's your walk with God. So now I want to give you the overwhelming list. I told you it's overwhelming. These are... This, these are some of the things that would help you to be, become more like Jesus. And, and I realize that you've been looking at this list for about 15 seconds or so, 10, 15 seconds. Um, I've been looking at this for weeks. And I look at this and I'm like, good grief. I'm like, I'm doing two of those. Like how in the world 
am I supposed to fit those 13 and maybe some more into my schedule? Like, what else needs to change? And I realized that that can be overwhelming. You're like, okay, now how do I do that? And I, I get it also that many of you, you've never been taught how to do this. This is where the community of faith comes in. Because for you, it, it, would be, it wouldn't even be right for me to go through and be like, here's what you need to do. Read your Bible. You need to meditate. What's meditate? Just meditate. Just do it. Read your Bible. I don't, where should I start? Just grab it. Read it. Do it. You know, scripture memory. What should I memorize? Start in Genesis. You know, living a simple life. And like, it wouldn't be fair if I just offloaded all these things onto you. So instead, what I want to do from here on out is I want to walk you through how to do them. So that you can become more like Jesus. I'm not just trying to to back the dump truck of burden onto your soul and be like, here, add this to your other list of things that you're not doing well. That's why we need the community of faith. That's the, the private. Some of these are private practices. Some of these are public practices. And we need one another to know how to do these things so that we can become more like Jesus. So that we as a body, and that's what, that's what we're called in the New Testament, a body so that we can all grow. But as we can grow, so we're not slurping the milk anymore, so that we're moving on to the solid food and becoming who it is that Jesus wants us to become. So the question you're asking right now is this, how can we do all of them at the same time? It's a great question. See, I knew what you were thinking. It's a special thing that me and Jesus have. I don't know. Not really. This is the way I feel when I look at this list, so I'm sure that some of you feel this way. So I want to give you this story from Eugene Peterson, and I want to read it, and I just want you to listen to it, and you're going to find so much hope in it. I told you there was hope, and there is, because the way that he helped me understand this, also, it was a way for me to understand that, that there's not just some offloading of, and just a, a dump truck of burden being dumped on my soul with a lot of other things that I don't know how to do. So this is what he says, and this becomes incredibly Hopeful and helpful. The disciplines, that would have been all the things you saw on the screen. Could we go back one so we see the things on the screen? Thank you. The disciplines are like garden tools. The soil is the human soul. The rain and sunshine are the staple disciplines such as interaction with the Bible and prayer. The other tools are over in the shed to be used when it's time to weed, till, plant, or do some other task. The disciple has fasting and solitude and journaling and the others in the tool shed when needed. He says, so the things that we need to do primarily, we need to have our time in the scriptures and prayer. And those things are like the sunshine and the rain. Those we need all the time. But yet we go to the tool shed for all the other 13 things that are on the list. We, 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 we go to those things. We go to the tool shed when, when, we, when we need this, when we get overwhelmed with life and, and when we start to live a life that we're starting to be a consumer, we're starting to be greedy, then we lean heavily into what Jesus said and how Jesus modeled living a life of simplicity and saying, wow, I am way too attached to my things. So I'm going to detach myself from these things so I can live more simply. So I'm, I'm, I'm not allowing this greed to grow. Instead, I'm just trying to starve it out. Maybe for you, you've gone through this season in your life where you, you yourself felt like life just chucked you off the back of, of, of the treadmill of life, so to speak, and just kind of threw you to the wayside. And you feel like, wow, I just, I don't even know what, Happened. I was just, I, I just started running and I outpaced myself and all of a sudden I ended up flat on my back and hurting. And maybe that's where you are right now and, and maybe what you need is, is to just slow down. To control what you can control and trust God to handle what you can't control. All of these practices, these disciplines are ways for us to have our hearts and our minds reoriented back to God. There are things that we need to do as we're abiding, as we're trusting, 
as we're reading, as we're praying, as we're journaling, as we're celebrating, as we're sharing our faith, as we're worshiping, as we are a good steward of our things. All of these things are, are, are methods that God uses, practices that God uses to bring us back to Him. I want to close with this. When I was a, a kid, we lived in town, right in town of Taylorville for a period of time in my life. And we rented this house and it was a blessing because it was right across the street from my dad's work. And on one side, um, there was a house really, really close. And then on the other side was a house even closer. And that's where my best friend lived. His name was Todd. And uh, so we lived in this house and my best friend Todd lived right next door and his younger brother and I had a older brother and I asked my dad I just wore my dad out I was like dad I want a basketball hoop I want a basketball hoop I want it in my yard I want a basketball hoop Um, there was my my other neighbor had a basketball hoop but they also had a very large Labrador and his name was rebound and he liked to play basketball too and the problem is all he did was foul so if you played on the court with rebound he would take you out so it became not fun at all and all that, dog would do, all that dog did was sleep, eat, and chase the basketball. Like he was huge. He wasn't like fit. He was like two Labradors in one. And so I didn't want to go down to their house anymore because rebound was there. So I wanted to play basketball at our house. So I just wore my dad out and, and he procrastinated. I have this, uh, unfortunately, I have the same character trait from my dad, procrastinate when it comes to things. No surprise for those who live in my household. And so I wore my dad out, and eventually I talked him into making or setting up a basketball goal. And it was great. It was a great day. I remember when he did it. It was just awesome. It was right in between the two garages. So um, it made it, it was really narrow, but it was really good. And my dad made it out of a telephone pole. So it was a little weird. Layups, you would also like body check the, the telephone pole. Became an issue. You'd have to become a contortionist to get a layup so you didn't get damaged and end up in the ER. But... It was really, really cool. We, we enjoyed that, that whole season. I remember when my dad put up that basketball goal. But the problem is this. When my dad put up the basketball goal, he didn't know it needed to be at 10 feet. He put it at 11 feet. So I have these aspirations of being a basketball player. And, uh, and, and so, and also my dad, I, I, I reminded him countless times. I'm like, dad, but it's 11 feet. If you could just get the ladder and lower it to 10 feet, it'd be a lot better for me. So I learned how to shoot. But he thought, you know what? I put the thing up. I'm done. So we moved and it was still there at 11 feet. And I, I never reached my, my true ability. And I had a little bit of ability to shoot and I was kind of fast. But I never reached my ability to play basketball because I was using the wrong size goal. If you and I or to live the Christian life that God wants us to, we have to have the right goals in mind. And the right goal for us is to have a life that is becoming more like Jesus, which means that we're going to have less of our false self and we're going to have more of our true self. And the only way that we're going to have these things is if we're truly abiding in Him for direction and connection, and as, as if we're imitating his example. But when we do, but when we get this right, then we can, we can truthfully say that we're living our lives for the glory of God. And we can truthfully say that I can leverage my life for the good of the world. You see, that's the payoff. When we become more like Jesus, it isn't that we can have an inflated ego because that's the wrong size goal. It's not a matter of ego. It's not a matter of so I can look more spiritual than you. It's just so that I can have the spiritual greatness that I am called to have. I can live out the destiny that I'm supposed to live out. And you're, you can live out the destiny that you're to live out. You're not supposed to walk in my shoes and I'm not supposed to walk in yours. That's the wrong size goal. God has a plan for you. And when we get it right, our whole world will be changed. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you so thankful that you are faithful like we sang about earlier. God, you're so faithful. I think back to the times in my life where I was so unfaithful to you and to others that you had this standard set for me and I was just continually falling short. The times that I've been selfish. The times that 
that I have been in the, the dark nights of my soul and, and I was just slurping the milk and I wondered why life wasn't working out the way that it should have been. Lord Jesus, I repent of those on behalf of these great people. God, I pray that, the, that your spirit would move in their lives so this, this wouldn't just be a message to be heard, but it would be a movement in the heart to be created. God, I'm reminded of Ezekiel 36 when you say that when somebody commits their life to you that they have a new spirit and a new heart, a heart to love you, a heart to serve you, a heart to honor you, a heart to glorify you, a heart to be connected in community, a heart to be used by you. Father, help us. We're all weak and we need the strength that only you can provide. We trust you, Jesus, that you're going to meet us right where we are and take us to where you want us to go. Amen. Amen.